teachers, parents, students, ladies and gentlemen. First, may I say just how delighted I'm to be with you this morning. Reflecting on my life, thinking about what I have experienced, the challenges I've faced, the dreams I've had during the course of my life, some of them were crashed, shattered into a thousand pieces. But again and again, I guess I'm one of the kind of person who's rather stubborn, had the courage, determination to pick up those shattered pieces and carry on forward, trying to tell myself nothing have happened before then. Really, for me to stand in front of you as one of the former top dancers in the world, an international best-selling author, a relatively successful stockbroker, and somebody foolishly made a, a movie based on my life, truly is never meant to be part of my life or journey. Because I was born into an utterly impossible beginning. So for me to dig out of that deep hole I was born into, I indeed had to rely on these huge dreams, enormous ideas, at times they seemed so impossible to attain. So this morning, I'd like to share certain aspects of my life experience with you. And to share with you why I have taken a recent, a new challenge in my life, despite my life seemed to be in a such a sweet spot. Couldn't be any more perfect. But yet, this excitement about these big ideas, how could I possibly make that work? Make it from a dream into reality, had propelled me to take on this new challenge in my life. I'd like to show you a slide. Now, if you, have, if you know anything about China, by looking at this picture, you would know this is a commune village in China. Not any commune village. This was my village, the village I was born into. Now, this picture, you know, typically you would relate to this kind of sad image belonging to the 1920s or 30s of China. But it couldn't be existing today, would they? Because China is the system, the global economic savior, helping everybody along the way, and helping making Australia as wealthy as we are today in the last 15 or 20 years. But this picture was, picture was only taken as recent as 10 years ago. I would like then just you just then imagine for a second, what would my village be looking like back in 1961? was the year I was born into. But between then and now, this village has been renovated many times over, a hundred times better than the sad state I was born into. I was born into utter poverty in Mao's Communist China. I was the sixth of seven peasant sons. We had no running water when I grew up. We had to walk miles carrying buckets of water home each day, little, almost no heating. The temperature in my hometown could get down to between 18 to 20 degrees below zero at winter time. When you put a cup of water outside within hours, that water would turn to ice. Was that cold? There's no ice, there's no heat inside. But the memory I haunted me all my life was the starvation I had experienced as a child. So many meal times, my poor mother had nothing to cook for her seven sons. She had bare her pride, knocking door after door. She hoped she could borrow enough food to get us by that night. But even then, when food often finally arrived in front of us, we just stared at this little bit of food in front of us. We knew we were going to go to sleep, sleep starving yet again. It was never enough for us to eat. It was then 
our parents would always say to children, to us, says, we're not hungry, you go ahead and eat. So by starving themselves, they prayed and hoped none of their children would die of starvation that very night. The three years prior I was born, there were roughly between 35 to 40 million people died of starvation in China. When I was young, certain years, even all the tree barks have been eaten <laughs> by desperate people in my village. Just, just think for a second. About nearly twice the population of Australia died of starvation in these three years. Really, the time I was born. Now, when I was a child, the reason, one of the strong reasons that I still dare to dream, have the courage to dream big, partly inspired by some little stories, fables, my father had imparted to us. One little fable he kept telling us stuck with me from my journey, which made immeasurable differences. At times when things just got so tough in my life, I truly felt bent against the brick wall. On the verge of chucking the towels, it's all, all too hard. I need to find an easy way out. Those kind of moments, this simple fable kept reminding me where I had come from and how hard I should be trying if I, if I want to simply change my fate. I'd like to share this simple fable with you today. It is about this little frog born into a deep well. For all his life, he was taught to limit by the sky, occasional stars and the moon, but mainly this dreadful cold and darkness was all life had offered. Until one day, this land frog above told him there's a bigger and better world out there, far more to explore, to experience, and to enjoy. He didn't believe it. He went to his father and said, Father, please tell me that's not true. Others don't have more than we do in life. And only then his father told his son. He had also heard there's a bigger and more beautiful world out there. But throughout his life, he had tried and tried with utter desperation. Tried his deep, deep, deep well he was born into. He told his son there's simply no way out for them. The land was too far away for them to ever escape. So he told him to give up, give up hope, accept it. The sad fate, the deep wells they were born into. Now that was the fable my father taught us. Rather than give up hope, rather than accept the status quo, the impossible lives I was born into. But upon hearing that story, made me even more sad. I suddenly believed and secretly wished one day, maybe one day, an opportunity will come my way. Just allow me one simple chance in life. This one chance, this one opportunity, all of a sudden happened one day. I could still remember this moment so vividly. It snowed so hard the night before, and it continued to snow the following day. Snow had piled over a meter high in places across the countryside. Peasants barely shuffled this thick snow, hard a dirt road, so people could simply pass through. That morning, I was wearing these thick, cotton quilt and cotton pants. My mother had sewn it for me. With that, I looked like this round snowball. We were sitting in this heatless, brazenly cold classroom, which made a simple mud coming shack, much worse looking than the picture I've just shown you. Nothing like the classrooms you got or the hall you have. It was absolutely freezing. We didn't even have a window uh, with glass panels on it. We had a window, all right, but we had plastered rice paper because they had to be so thin to allow the light to shine through. But because they are so thin, the strong wind blowing the big snowflakes around, they stuck onto the snowflakes, stuck onto the rice paper, subsequently 
the holes just kind of flew through it. So they flustered and the, the fluttered and the wind is pouring. We all sent in a shiver. Now, what's supposed to keep us warm was our teacher told us to read this We Love You Chairman Mao text 10 times in a row. You can well imagine just how heartwarming that was. <laughs> As though your teacher is telling you to read this We Love You Julia Gillard 10 times in a row. <laughs> so, my generation Chinese went through the most unbelievable brainwash by Mao's political propaganda. We were virtually born with Mao's little red book by our bedside, and all you were allowed to read was Mao's political literature. No Harry Potter's, no nothing of the interesting stories you're reading today. All political. So in the middle of that reading that day, four men suddenly were led into our class. They were introduced to us as Matt Mao's cultural advisors from the Beijing Dance Academy. And they were there to select talents to study ballet. Ballet. What is ballet? There's no such thing in our lives, thing. no music, no opera. We didn't even have a space like this, no theater, no cinema, where I lived. So we didn't know what ballet was. And then these people from Beijing asked all to stand up to sing songs. You can well guess, the only kind of a songs we are ever taught and allowed to sing was We Love You, Chairman Mao kind of songs. In the middle of that singing, these four men walk along the aisles, look at each person's faces, trying to get some vague idea of our physical body shape through our snow-like clothes. <laughs> so at first, they passed me by without taking any notice. Out of the 40 odd kids in the room that day, he selected one girl. But just as when they were leading that girl out of the door, my class teacher stood by the door, she hesitated. And it suddenly came on the shoulder of the very last gentleman, virtually just as that man was about to walk out of the room. She said to him, excuse me, sir, what about that one? And that one was me. You'd be surprised to hear this throughout my journey. I was too busy pursuing my faraway dreams. I never really stopped and thought that moment, how important that moment played in my life. Only when I sat down to write my autobiography about 11 years ago now, that was the first time I really thought about that moment. Life changing moment. Of course, I want to find out why did that teacher ever single me out that day. Eventually, I tracked it down and found out. I said, Teacher Sun, could you please tell me why did you single me out that day? She said to me, Lee, for all these years, I wondered. I still don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Not for a million years, but I expected such an unglamorous answer. Now, let me ask you a question. <coughs> what would happen to me? What would happen to me, to my life, if that teacher hadn't pointed me out? I would still be a peasant stuck in that deep well. One incredible opportunity to change my entire life. Now, the, the strange thing is, when I'm looking back at that moment, in hindsight, it changed everything for me. But at the time, it was a nothing moment. It was, it was an opportunity. As I said to you, I didn't even know what ballet was. What's that ballet? How was that going to do for me? To get food on the table, to help my family. I won't die of starvation. Would ballet will help me? At that time, that was so far remote. It wouldn't, didn't even enter my mind, but somehow, that one moment made all the difference. The smallest moment in my life, I thought at the time. You know, there's no big signs with big writing on it, flying by my face that Lee, tread this, the tread this moment, this will change your life. Nobody tap on my shoulder and says, Lee, this will give you an incredible life. But this is what I say to you. Don't waste any opportunities come your way in life. Treasure them. Because you don't know. Sometimes the smallest opportunities can make the biggest difference in one's life. 
provided you are the one to put your total dedication, your passion, the greatest work ethic into that opportunity. Prove to, to, to yourself to see just how far you can go with that. I promise you, when you can put that kind of dedication, energy, passion, and a great work ethic into making this small opportunity into the big success in life, then nothing will stop you from achieving greatness in life. So that day, I was led into the head of school's office. There were 10 of us selected all across school between the age of 8 to 12. I was 10, just about turning 11. We all lined up in front of these people from Beijing. One person shouted out, says, take all your clothes off except your underwear. But nobody moved. The reason for that was because we were so poor in those days, nobody could afford to wear a pair of underwear. <laughs> Eventually, through despair, they measured every inch of our body. Suddenly, I was put against one of the wall. One person held one knee straight. Second person pushed both my shoulders hard against the corner of the walls. I could not move a single inch. And the third person forced my other leg up, up and up, high up in the air. As forcing my legs higher and higher, I, she, uh, he and, and the other lady kept asking, does it hurt? I kept smiling and said, no, it doesn't. <laughs> of course, it hurt like hell. <laughs> It was the kind of pain I have never experienced in my life. I, I'll say to the teachers, if any of your kids are misbehaving, put them in that position, lift their leg up. <laughs> that will really fix the attitude. <laughs> and that, during the course of that audition, they torn both my hamstrings. But that was only the beginning of this long and grueling audition process. They went through that common level, the county, city, provincial, national level, all across China, they searched and searched. We were told that man mouse people that year went through millions of kids across China. They only selected 44. Across China, they selected 44. Not only you have had this incredible physical talent, but you also have to have this tough mental strength. So just turning 11, I went to Beijing, left my family for seven years training ballet. I'm only allowed to see them twice a year. The first day I was there, I was led into the head of the ballet studio, uh, sorry, into a, a, a ballet studio. You know ballet bars are often mounted on the walls. When you're that little, the bar seems as high as your shoulder or neck high. And the teacher, let's call that one. The teacher will ask you to put one leg on the bar, square leg in front of you like this, right? They ask you to lock your, uh, uh, your, your fingers. They pull your body forward. Now, they, you can't bend your knee. The chest has to rest on the knee, the head touches the toes. If you did not get that low enough, the teacher will come behind you, force his entire weight by your force body down. So you not pull your hamstrings during the audition process, you were torn there and then. That was my first day of dance room. Was truly a single swing at the Beijing Dance Academy. I was absolutely hopeless. I hated ballet with passion. Even seeing some of my teachers walk with turnout feet like all the way from the suit, I thought to myself, they look like, like, like ugly darkies walking. And I swear to myself, I never looked like it. I, I was very weak, even though I had some flexibility, I had a, a very good body proportion-wise. But I was not as flexible. I did not have the muscle strength to jump, to turn. Every time I tried to leap in the air, some of the teachers were laughing from my face. They would describe my legs as overcooked spaghetti with no strength. I'll just show you a second slide. And that was me years later. Of course, I didn't have this muscle stress thing. Now, for dancers, you have to have two basic ingredients to make, it, to make the grade, to make it into any company. 
you have to be able to jump really high and beautiful jumps, effortless, soaring to the air. Or you have to be able to, and, and also you have to be able to turn free. You have to be able to stand on five little poles in this position or that position and keep on turning, 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 turning. Right? And uh, I, as a child, I have this terrible motion sickness problem. <laughs> I, uh, every time I get up on the bus, I feel my guts will start to spill out. <laughs> so you can imagine this part of it is before I started spinning, I just felt my, I was, my whole guts was knotted. So the, my teachers told me, I can't jump, I can't turn. And I was rather lazy. And I hated to be in the studio. I hadn't been told what to do. So they were virtually about, on the verge of firing me. On the verge of being sent back home. Then something happened. One amazing teacher walked into my life. He was my new body teacher. The one thing he went out his way to inspire us was through vision, through shoot dreams, shoot ideas. Bali was so on Chinese, it's so Western. And Bali was writing a new art form in China. We were hopeless. Didn't know how to train dancers and all that. But he was determined. There's no reason why Chinese dancers cannot be the world's top dancers. So many teachers laughed at his naive notion. They thought he was crazy. He was mad. But he didn't care. That's how he inspired us. He would say to us often, he said, look, you know, some of the legends, Horishini Kofanoria, Margot Fontaine's world, they just become legends in the body world. They said, well, look, they got two arms, they got five, uh, ten fingers, they got, you know, five, five toes on each, on each of their foot. You, you probably have got enough intelligence, just as much intelligence as they do. So what do you lack in physical? What do you lack? Of course, we're human beings made roughly the same. We have the similar number of cells and all that allow us to function normal. So it's really all coming down to up here. Often, you know, in life, People are not lacking of ideas. We all dream, we close our eyes, and we go to sleep, whether you are conscious or subconscious, in your subconscious mind, you often dream big, don't you? You say, only if I could do that. But why don't you? Why don't you act upon these big dreams, big ideas? If you dare to dream, why don't you dare yourself to put them into action? 99.9% .9 of times, people just talk themselves out of it due to fear, due to insecurity. I remember, we all got one life to live. One life to live. With a blink of an eye, you will have gray hair like me. It's that big. When I look it back, my Beijing dance camp days, I was your age group. That was the same as yesterday. But I've got children older than you now. Thank you.